All right, we are live. Welcome to today's New Year's stream. I see Chris, the Watch Lounge is, is here. Jason, what's up from sunny Florida? YZ80, Dan Sam 95, Random Rob. Hey, how you doing, man? Alex and Kevin in Florida. How's it going? I got your email, your your uh, your latest email. Thanks, guys, for tuning in. I appreciate it. I hope your uh, new year has been awesome so far. And uh, in this live video, I'm, I'm going to um, talk watches with one of my older friends. Not uh, that sounds rude. He's he's gonna he's gonna tease me. One of my oldest watch friends. You know, we've we've been uh, we've been acquaintances for years, and I've actually had him over to my house before. And hey, Cowboy Swami, what's going on? Godfrey Chips, how's it going? Uh, so anyways, let me introduce him. We'll bring him here on the channel. We'll talk watches. We'll recap a little bit of 2021. And then uh, we'll go into what we, we would like to do in 2022. Obviously take some questions. Uh, yeah, Dan Sam is only here to see Mark. So that's awesome. Um, yeah, let's let's bring in Mark right now. Well, you know, I may, Bruce, I may be your oldest friend, but I just want to check. Do, do you have permission from your mother to be up this late? <laughs> I do have some gray, right? I'm not that young, right? Well, you know, here we are. Yeah. Well, thank you for, for coming on with me today, Mark. I appreciate it. I know it's a holiday and you're busy with, with a lot of things. You're a dog trainer. I got nothing better to do than hang out with you and and uh, and and shoot the bull and talk about watches with 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 these good people in the peanut gallery. So thank you for having me, Bruce. Yeah, you bet. You bet. Um, yeah, we've got actually quite a few people here. That's awesome. That's really cool. Well, I have prepared a, a little video that I'm gonna that I'm gonna sh that I'm gonna roll here on the live stream, and it talks about some of the watches that I've owned over the past year. I have a few of them here in a desk view that we'll pull up here in a minute, but let me go ahead and run this video. It's about a minute long, and then we'll uh, we'll come back and talk. Let's see. an assault on your senses isn't it you are so talented that that was a beautiful little video I, I i'm so pleased and happy for you you're, you're doing beautiful work and your channel is just exploding and it couldn't have happened to a better guy for sure i appreciate it mark i do that means a lot and the funny thing is people think it's like some kind of luck is involved oh no this is like ten thousand hours of editing hard work and planning that you do so the, the harder you work the luckier you get but you really deserve it well well done sir Thank you. Well, let's talk about this past year, Mark. We've we've purchased some awesome watches um, from a number of different brands. I know you've come prepared with a few oh, that yeah. you'd like to share. Why don't you pull the first one out here and let's talk about it? Well, you know what? Why don't we start with a quick fist watch check? And today, fellas, <laughs> I'm not wearing a Rolex at all, although I suspect we're going to talk a lot about Rolex because it's... sure. It's kind of what I do. Um, but this is the Glasute Original 
Panorama CQ. It's a, it's a big mouthful, um, but it's also a big watch. Forty three and a half. You know, you did a review of this watch, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, I did that, and that one was so easy to film. I think some watches. I mean, you've got to get the lighting just right. This one, I mean, you could go outside on a cloudy day and it would look marvelous. It's such a stunner. It's a beautiful thing. Um, I think I, um, my, my favorite part of it really are the Arabics. I'm kind of a sucker for loomed Arabics. And so this, this has very nice loom, super luminova, it, but, but it's kind of blue. It's not real green. So it's, it doesn't last as long as the green stuff does, but when it's torched up, it looks incredible. And it has, I think, a five-day power reserve, something like ridiculous. One of the things that I love about that one, Mark, is mm. it's a big watch, but the movement is big too. It's not like tiny, you know, with an exhibition back where you're looking at like a nickel in the size of a half dollar, right? That's you know, appropriately yeah. proportioned. I'll tell you what, though, um, I came very close to having a small but passionate affair with a, a Tag Heuer Aqua Racer until I watched somebody's video revealing the plastic spacer inside the... Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, <laughs> that was you, sir. Yes. Uh, you, you revealed the, uh, the inner workings. And, um, you know, that kind of spoiled it for me. But um, you're right. This, uh, th this is a, uh, a hand-decorated and finished movement, and it, it fills this fills up the space really nicely. It's a little heavy. It, uh, it, this must be about 170 grams, um, but it is cool. Has a there's a button right here on the on the clasp, so it does have an adjustable its own sort of like version of glide lock because that pushes in, and then the bracelet slides in and out. So yeah. I could I could be wrong, Mark, but I believe they were the first brand to do that style of micro adjustment. And now IWC does that hidden, you know, logo style. But I mean, it was years and years ago when they started doing that. And I think it's really ingenious. Well, honestly, it's a better solution really than what you get out of Rolex. Um, because the, and anything with the glide lock class, which would be the Submariner and then the, um, the, 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 um, the sea dweller, you've yeah. got to remove it from the, you have to remove it. Um, yeah. from your wrist in order to mess around with it. And this you can do on the fly. The best glide lock clasp that Rolex does is on the deep sea sea dweller or the James Cameron version of that, where you just kind of like pick it open. And most people don't know, but the that particular watch has yeah. a different form of glide lock clasp that you don't remove from the wrist. I got to ask you, how have you been wearing yours very much? I know you mm -hmm. bought one years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. Um, okay, so... I did, I, I, I went away, here's my problem. I have a rotation issue. So I constantly want to play with watches. I go watch shopping among my own, you know, inventory that I keep here. And the, the James Cameron doesn't often make it into rotation. So I was going on a dog training trip to teach in New York where I was going to be gone from home. So I, I went and I thought the only way that I can really force myself to try and bond better with the James Cameron is to bring it with me and make it my one and only watch. So that's what I did. And I was really aware of the thickness. It's, it's the height of that watch that yes. I think is really the issue. But, um, you know, after a couple of days, I didn't even notice it anymore. And I had a really nice week with it. And, it, and it's a very impressive watch. And although it's large, the, it's, the legibility is incredible. The loom is because there's so much. These, the hour dots are so big. The hands are so large that the yes. loom is incredible. So, um, you know, I, but I, 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 I'm committed to wearing it at least one week a year, <laughs> but that's about it. <laughs> Let me show you what I'm wearing. Yeah. Uh, if you can see that, this is I the like Panda uh, Tudor Black Bay Chronograph. Mm. And I really like the size on this. I mean, it's more substantial than a Daytona, but, you know, carries the similar styling, similar color scheme. And I love the snowflake hands. I just like the way it sits. It's got the date at the six o'clock. And this is one that I've only had for a few weeks. I uh, bought this earlier, actually in December, and it's it's been awesome. So I've, I've been wearing that one today. That's what I'm wearing. Now, I watched your video review of that one. Um, yeah. You know what? The, I feel like you and Random Rob are my two personal drug pushers because it seems like what, when I don't know if the guys in the audience, you know, let us know in the comments if you feel the same way. But what I find is anything that Random Rob and, uh, and Bruce review 
Um, it just makes me want the watch, right? So I watched this review that you did of the um, of that Tudor Panda, and even though recently I was, you know, blessed with a with a with a Panda Daytona, which I will show you right here, right now. Oh yeah, and we will talk about. But yeah. I, it really, really made me want that. Oh, you're this way. It really made me want that Tudor, you know, that he has. And um, because, like, look at that thing. It's it, it's just cool. <laughs> it's got the date. And um, until I got to the part of your video where you showed the loom, because the one thing that this doesn't have is, like, you know, this is not a really good nighttime watch. Yeah, you got a little bit of loom, but sure. I have a lot more. But then it looked like that hour hand has just a thin strip of loom, and it looks like it fades pretty quick on the hour hand of that watch. So can you read the time at night, like an hour after torching it? Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. No, it's 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 the snowflake, man. It's It's got it's, enough of that square to where, yeah. It, I mean, it's not one that you'll wake up at three in the morning and go, oh, I can still read, but. It's the minute hand. Excuse me. The hour hand is snowflake, so it's bulky and it has a lot of loom. Oh, it's sure. Okay. Yeah, hand. no, the. The minute hand is fairly thin. That's that's true. So can you read that sucker? That's all I want to know. Yeah, yeah, I can. Um, excuse me. Let me block a spammer real quick. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Yeah. No, I I can read it, but I mean it's it's not a dive watch, even though it has yeah. two hundred meters of water resistance. Um, the proportions of the hand could be adjusted, I think, when it comes to the loom strip. I understand. Well, I don't. I, I don't know. Jonathan is saying you had to sit there and pretend you didn't review. We talked about we talked about that review that Bruce did. It was an excellent review. And actually, yeah, here's another weirdness that I do. When I want to con reconnect with a watch that I own and I want to love it a little bit more, I watch video reviews of the watch that I already own. Um, oh, yeah. I've done that too, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I will often watch uh, you reviewing uh, a variety of watches, including this Glashut. So when I'm thinking, should I pull it out? Should I, should I go dig it out of the bank? Um, I'll, I'll watch Bruce Williams on that. And then, uh, but um, okay. So you want to hear the story of the panda? I'd love to hear it. Okay, guys. So, um, well, first, it's obviously very difficult to get one of these at MSRP. Um, in January of 2021, so about a, a year ago, I made a video where I predicted that its price would hit $40,000 last year, which it did. Um, and that's a, a little bit where it is right now, although we have to talk about the price of this watch because that price just changed today. Sure. So we could talk about that too. But anyway, um, and at the time, people thought I was nuts because I, only one year ago, the Panda was second hand, secondary market, gray market, $25,000. And now it's 40, and that's what I thought it was going to do. And bam, it did it. Um, but even at $25,000, that was double retail. Your AD had to really, really, really trust you and like you in order to sell you this watch. I mean, trust you because if you walk out into the parking lot, psst, hey, buddy, want to buy a Panda? You could, you could turn a quick, you know, even a year ago, ten thousand dollar profit, and that's very tempting to a lot of people. So they really had to trust that you weren't going to do that, because Rolex doesn't like it when they yeah. start, you know, and, and and they worry about losing the line, and then they have to like you because they got a hundred and fifty people calling them probably every month, asking for the same watch. So it's sort of like opening your chocolate bar and finding the golden ticket to get this, but they, they did put me on a list for it. I got this one at James and Sons in Orland Park, Illinois. Mm -hmm. And um, and it took a matter of years. <laughs> like I, and I eventually I figured, especially when the factory closed for COVID, I was like, okay, this is, this is, you know, I'm cooked. I'll never get one now because production went away, demand went up, price went crazy. And there I was on the wait list, but uh, I got the call. Um, I got the call the same week that you got the call. Yeah. For, for your new Rolex. And I want to shout out Ronald here. Uh, this is Rocky who, who worked at the Orland Park. Rocky. I, yeah. I'm Rocky. Rocky's a good guy. For sure. Really good guy. Yeah. I, I know because we were calling each other and messaging each other like, Hey, I got the call. Oh no way. I got the call. And uh, that was a, that was a really fun week. So. Yeah. So please continue. 
It, it was super exciting. Well, so anyway, you know, I, I went in and, and you know, if, if you remember like the old method of buying a Rolex, and, and I'm sure, I know Rocky does. The old method was you'd go in and they'd give you a glass of champagne as they cracked open your watch and thank you for buying it. That's not how this should work anymore. You got to bring the champagne for them. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so I dealt with uh, uh, my, my, my friend over there, now friend, um, who Rocky introduced me to, uh, Brian. Uh, and, and I brought Brian, Brian a really nice bottle of, uh, of, you know, you can't bribe anybody to sell you Rolex, but you can certainly be grateful for it. Yeah, and that's part of it. It's part of having good manners, good etiquette. I think that's very important considering, you know, the watch that you've just been offered. Well, they I'm have really... so much choice, you know, in terms of where um, your troll is back. So you, I'll, I'll blab while you deal with that. Well, sorry about that. Let me try to block this uh, tool right here. Block. <laughs> You're out of here. Get out of here. Very persistent. I promise it's not me. Look, you can see my hands all at the same time. But anyway, um, so now this thing is up at $40,000. Guys, what happened this week was um, Rolex increased prices. And you may have heard that because a couple of people, myself included, made videos about the price increase. Um, the, the, the average price increase, it averaged out across the board to 3.4%, which sounds pretty low because the rate of inflation in the United States is probably that higher than that. But what they didn't tell you was that that was an across the board average that that is not per watch because there's some no. watches like the 28 millimeter ladies date just they barely they it went up like one percent wow. yeah my sky dweller went up i think like four hundred dollars it wasn't much but other yeah. models went up by like a thousand you know yeah the gmt and the so the popular stuff went up a bunch more yeah um, i think the gmt and the samariners all popped up by like a thousand dollars the daytona popped from i think 133 more or less mm -hmm. to like call it 145 14550 so this actually went up a little more than 10%. So not only was this an impossible watch to get but i got it for 13 and change instead of 14 and a half thousand dollars a week later just like one week later they would have had to charge me another $1500 for this watch. So <laughs> what's the tax too? Uh, you know, right, which is like you, you know a lot on a when you, when you get up into purchases of these areas, but I, yeah. I, obviously I felt good about the buy. Um, I, I didn't buy it to sell it. I don't intend to sell it, but there is a certain pleasure in knowing that it's re at least retaining its value. And if the roof blows off of your house and you got to quickly, you know, convert something to cash that you could, if you needed to. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Let's take a quick question. Uh, Timeless Sneakers and Watches asks, Bruce, if you had the option to pick up the Panda Daytona, would you pick it over your Tudor or would you keep the Tudor? Forget about resale value. Just focus in on the watches for what they are. Let me pull up my desk view real quick here and take off my watch and put it up in front of the camera. There we go. So to answer your question, I think these are different enough to where I don't think it's an either or type of proposition you know i think they could both coexist in one collection and it would be fun because yeah they're similar i mean tudor rolex panda iteration yeah i mean look at that screw down function pushers but i think the subtle differences make each of them a little bit more enjoyable in their own avenue you know one is more proportional has more polish has more shine with the ceramic you know i think the daytona is more refined you know, in its look and this one, I think it's, again, it's different enough. So I, I, I don't think it needs to be, Hey, one or the other, I think you could do both. And if I was ever offered a Panda, you bet I'd go buy one. Um, and I'd enjoy it alongside the tutor because I think, you know, they're, they're both awesome. You know what though, Bruce, I would be a lot more inclined to wear that tutor on vacation to Barcelona than I would be this, because this just makes you a target. There are so many places where people um, look, the average person does not know anything about watches and don't, they don't care anything about watches, but there are criminal gangs in popular tourist areas that specialize in just strolling around and scoping them. And that uh, this thing just makes you a target. So I would be a whole lot more inclined to wear uh, that into many parts of Europe and, and, and the islands. And yeah. along that Avenue, Mark, do you, do you foresee, because I think, a lot of watch enthusiasts feel similarly. 
and they're not taking their high value or very noticeable Rolex models on vacation or on business trips, and they're taking different luxury watches, you know, perhaps from Grand Seiko or from Zenith or Omega or Breitling. And do you foresee a time where you can't even do that because, because there is such a demand for luxury products that you could flip quickly? I know that those other brands don't have the same type of appreciation that a Rolex does, but I mean, where do you start drawing the line is, is my question. I mean, you do raise a great point. I really don't want to go on a, on a, on a cruise wearing a G-Shock. <laughs> <laughs> Although, frankly, I love my G-Shocks, um, you know, for work and so forth. But uh, look, if I'm going someplace where I've even got to think about it or worry about it, I'm probably going to wear an Omega or a Breitling. I have a couple of those that I really like. Um, because I would be happy to like take them off and throw them, you know, that way while I'm running the other way. Who are the, you know, there's a lot of people who say, oh, no one is going to get my watch. I, you know, I'm carrying a Glock. Um, but but when you when you look at the nature of some of these robberies, they are very forceful, multiple people, element of surprise. I mean, you'd have to be uh, like a ninja or a Navy SEAL to draw a personal defense weapon. So I um, I think. Um, discretion is the better part of valor. Plus I'm a chicken. So <laughs> I, I just don't wear them anymore in, in places where I wear, and that's very limiting. Okay. Where are you going to wear? I have a gold Samariner. It's beautiful. Where can you wear it? You know? So sometimes I just wear it around, the, around the house and like stare at my wrist. <laughs> Well, there, I'm getting a few comments here. Uh, Watching on Wine says that he will wear his most expensive, wa expensive watch and not care. He doesn't want to live his life scared. Um, I, and you know what? Most people get away with it. Honestly, it's just there are some people who, who regret that. The last time, let me pull up my desk view again. The last time I traveled, I went to L.A. and I took this, the Cartier tank, mm -hmm. and I was going for an NFL game. And we were going to ride these scooters from the town we were in up to the stadium. And we didn't know, but as soon as you get into Inglewood, the, the town limits, the GPS cuts off your scooter. And so we had just crossed under a highway and there was, you know, this homeless camp off to the side and our scooters stop. <laughs> and nice. I'm wearing this stupid watch. Danger, Will Robinson, danger. <laughs> but uh, you know what? And maybe this is just particular to me. I kind of look like a bum all the time. I don't think people ever notice the watch on my wrist because they <laughs> nobody, the the people who notice the watch on your wrist are the people you don't want to. Yeah. The, the people you do are the people like the conversation starters on the plane or another guy with a nice watch. Those people never notice your watch. It are It is the professional, uh, you know, tandem team of uh, motorcycle riders in Buenos Aires, in Barcelona, in Rome. Those are the people who notice your watch. And it could be the bouncer at the club, the bartender at the bar, the waiter at the restaurant who makes a quick phone call. I, I got a guy and he'll be leaving in like 20 minutes. I'm just yeah. giving a check. This is sometimes how that goes. Yeah. Um, and before we go to Rolex heavy here, Mark, I think both of us, maybe you to more of a degree, but we, we get known as the Rolex fans, right? The enthusiasts like, Oh, Bruce and Mark. And they just like Rolex. How boring. But that's actually not the case at all. Like you have everything from micro brand to Casio to Seiko, <laughs> Breitling and Tudor. And like, do you have anything that you bought this past year that's not been Rolex that you have been particularly excited about? Maybe besides that glass Uta. So I bought a, a, a Breitling um, Super Ocean, the one, the, the newest Super Ocean with the Arabic numerals. Uh, it's a 42 millimeter watch. Yes. Uh, what what dial did you get? I got the blue one. Uh, yeah. and I just love it. Let me see if I can find you a picture of it while we're. Horsing. You know who did? I don't know if uh, if you've watched his channel before, Mark, but it's your terrific on YouTube. His name is Evan. So, if if that's who I'm thinking of, he's he's who I blame for this. Yeah, phenomenal <laughs> videos. Because I saw that video. He he did a video of this watch. Yeah, and, uh, oh, that's awesome. And that just. It, it wrecked me. I mean, it just, it just wrecked me. I had to have it. Um, so I, um, yeah, I mean, and, and not only that, but I'm, I'm, I am a big, huge sucker for a Breitling. Um, I, I think I bought my first one from you. That was an Avenger. Which... <laughs> yeah. We did that trade. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that oh was my God. yeah. So that was uh, that was Bruce, people. This was Bruce taking advantage of my naivete. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you know what? If you think about it for a minute, Bruce. Well, we did a two watch trade. Bruce traded me a couple watches, including that that um, yeah. that Avenger GMT Breitling for a um, Polar Explorer, the five digit reference number, right? Yeah. Uh huh. What what do you remember what it was trading for back then? Back then it was like thirty seven, maybe four thousand, and if it was better condition. Yeah. yeah. And um and and what are they going for now? Oh, I mean, if you see a good one with, um, I mean, this, the protruding end links, the solid ones, it can be like eight grand, you know, and it's almost as much as the, the retail price of the current, you know, version. That's right. On the market. So basically both of us should have kept that watch and neither of us did. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've, I've made so many boneheaded decisions over my, uh, time as a watch enthusiast, but you know what? I mean, you'll learn from it. You laugh at your mistakes and you move forward. Right. Okay. Did you ever make a mistake? Which, which, hold on, let me get this dog. Come here, you. Um, my, my shepherd is like trying to get my attention. Ooh. So, hey, you, sorry, Mark, let me interrupt you. Yeah. This, this seems uh, appropriate. You are an author, you're yeah. a dog trainer. Yeah. Can you please plug your products? I mean, oh, sure. <laughs> yeah. I, I'd, I'd love, I'd love to hear it. So, well, it, it's true. I'm, 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 a, I'm a dog trainer and a writer. I've written a couple of books that you can get anywhere in the world electronically or hardcover. Um, Let Dogs Be Dogs was the first one. And The Art of Training Your Dog is the second one. My email is markgoldberg8 at gmail.com. And I do behavior consultations for people who have like new puppies and can't sleep or the puppies biting up the family or have serious behavior problems in an adult sure. dog. So I do Zoom all over the world for that. Yeah, that's, that's lovely. Next time we're around, I've got to have you autograph your books. Yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll sign them to the dogs. But um, anyway, so the have you ever made a watch boo boo that cut so deep that you just couldn't heal from the wound? Like the watch that you sold that you're, you're just like, oh, uh, either the price went up or you can't find another one. You can't rebuy it. Just have, have you ever had a cut that was real deep? And I'll, I'll, after you answer that, I'll tell you about mine. Oh, oh, for sure. And mine is, is uh, you know, I mentioned the fact that I'm boneheaded. I completely destroyed a Rolex. You know, <laughs> you remember this, Mark. We've talked about it. Yeah. Uh, I, I was borrowing it from a friend of mine. And then after I did my video, I was going to return it to him. And I was buckling one of my girls in their car seat. And I had set it on the top of my car and then uh, just spaced it and drove away and it got smashed. I found the pieces of it, but uh, oh my goodness, that was, that was brutal. I was like, hey, I'm quitting YouTube. You know, this is awful. And then you probably remember that. I had probably a hundred people go, Bruce, don't quit. And I'll calm down. Just keep going. You Dramatic. let me watch this. I mean, I think I sent you a watch. I think I sent you a, a monster. Yeah. Or something. Or you, you know, because I felt so bad about how bad you felt. Actually, that wasn't what I was thinking. But, you know, that was brave <laughs> of you to like to toss that one out there. And people, here's the thing about Bruce. Okay. Bruce has this like total good guy, you know, baby face, guy next door, completely trustworthy persona. Um, but. Um, Bruce, you will recall that when I got my gold Submariner, I sent it to you so that you could review it. Sure. And you sent me a picture of it <laughs> in a FedEx box on the roof of your car. <laughs> I had to, <laughs> but I, 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 in my defense, like two seconds later, I had to say, just kidding, you know, cause I, I know that that wouldn't be funny if, it, if the reverse. Oh, so, this is a $35,000 yeah. watch in a FedEx box on top of Bruce's car. And I remember what happened last time he ran it over. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good times. Well, well, my, I don't want to say this was a watch regret, but there was, you know, there, there was an incident. And that is that I had, a, I had a Daytona previous to this one. And it's a very sad story, but uh, and I'll be brief. But, you know, if you go back in time a few years ago, like five, six, seven years, the, all the Rolex were a lot cheaper than they were now. They were yeah. way cheaper secondhand than new. Um, and the, even the ADs had stock. So I bought a perfectly nice steel Daytona with a white face for $10,000. 
um, which was an incredible amount of money for me to spend on a watch, especially at that time. And what I discovered was I didn't like it. I remember that. And I made a video called I Hate My Daytona, which has like 200,000 views or something crazy. <laughs> because everybody loves the Daytona, but I did not love it. Um, and I bought it for the wrong reasons. I bought it because I was just trying to impress, I think, a bunch of other watch guys, you know, with the, with the Holy Grail. Sure. And, um, yeah. So eventually I realized I got to get rid of this thing. But when you sell a watch, you, you do have to be careful about selling a watch because if you, if you buy like secondhand, but retail secondhand, by, by that I mean market rate, if you're going to sell back to a reseller, you have to leave them room for margin. Um, otherwise, you, you have to sell to an end user. But when you sell to an end user, which is like you good people in the room, you take the risk of fraud, which is why so many people just want to sell to a, to, a, to a trusted reseller. And that's what I did. So I sold that watch. <laughs> I hate this story. I sold that watch. <laughs> I sold a steel Daytona for $8,000. Um, which I put towards the James Cameron, but it wasn't enough. So I had to like add money. Sure. You know, and now the, 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 the James Cameron is down here and that Daytona, that same Daytona is about $25,000 now. So when I saw the Panda, it resolved for me what my aesthetic issues were with the steel one that I didn't like, which was there was no... The, There's no this, contrast in the old one. Correct. And what this black bezel does is it draws the eye together around the dial. It gives it wrist presence. And then there's this one other thing. Let's see if we can go in on the macro level. Let's do it. Um, I'll do my best. You might not be able to see it here, depending on the light and the quality of this camera. But on the tip of the minute hand and in a couple places on the hour hand, there are actually black demarcations on the hands to uh -huh. add to the contrast yes. of the hands, which makes this particular white dial far more legible than the previous white dial, which I could never read the time on it. But on this one, I can read the time and it's because you have to go in really tight, but there are, um, there's some black marks surrounding the loom um, on, on the hands. And so I really felt like if I could get this watch, it would heal me of that, of that wound, <laughs> you know, that self-inflicted wound. You know, when I just foolishly got bored with what became like the it watch of the century and just flicked it away for a watch that nobody wants, which was <laughs> and still nobody wants it. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it, it's, that kind of goes back to what we were saying is, you know, you don't collect for resale value or to flip. I mean, obviously you lost out on over 10 grand on that one Daytona <laughs> yeah. over being a little bit impatient. Right. Uh, but the fact that you've done that, I guess you could say, I think that speaks to you as a watch enthusiast, because again, you're not buying, of course you're buying some of the hard to get watches that do appreciate, but that's not why you're doing it. You're not flipping out of those and you're not making easy yeah. money. You know, I, I think that's a compliment actually. I mean, I have sold Rolex, but I've never sold Rolex that I bought from an AD. In fact, I have the first one that I ever bought from 1987, which I bought at an AD. Um, one of the things that I like about Rolex is, guys, you got to admit, we're spending just like stupid sums of money on boy toys. We've got a super chat. Hey. Big one. How's it going, BT? Uh, Happy New Year, boys. Keep up the good work. How much do you think the increased liquidity of watches is driving what we see in the market? I think quite a bit. Mark, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I absolutely agree. Insta Blaine. Um, yeah, and this is a little bit what it's all, that that question or comment is absolutely on point with what I was referring to now. I mean, listen, if you are stupendously wealthy, then you can throw a hundred thousand dollars into watches and it, it won't matter. I it, for me it matters. Um, and so the, the the liquidity is exactly what drives the market at this point because Rolex is is like a commodity item. It's like a sure bet. It's almost like gold bullion. Right. Sure. Where there's, a, where there's a price and, you know, you can buy and you can sell. What I know when I buy Rolex is if that I can that I can dump out of it without getting hurt. And um, and that's actually not only driving a, the, 
Rolex is the top, is the ocean, which is lifting up all the other boats. And that is why so many other brands are increasing in value and selling as well as they can, because you can't get a Rolex hardly anymore. So it's just, yeah. they're really driving the whole market. But I think that the, the economy of, of horology is making collectors um, both attracted to the brand Rolex and, and other collectible brands but, and, and simultaneously angry at those brands. Yeah. And I think a contributing factor is also how many more watch enthusiasts seem to be in the game right now, as opposed to five or six years ago when, I mean, yeah, there were some forums, there were some well-known dealers around, but I think there seems to be a lot more exposure and a lot more competition these days, which I think kind of feeds the hype a little bit. Um, you know, it's to a small degree. I'm not, not saying a huge degree, but I think that's a factor as well. Well, you know, watch collecting has been written up recently in GQ magazine, Forbes, all yeah. kinds of the, the, <clears throat> the mainstream press is really leaping on the phenomenon and bringing this out to the masses. You have the millennials jumping with both feet into watches now. Um, the, the, the worldwide situation, um, which should have really slowed this market down a whole lot, had a weird side effect of, I think, speeding it up and uh, a couple few ADs have told me that their wealthy clientele, who normally would be jet setting around the world, taking expensive vacations, going on cruises, they stayed home. They had not, they still yeah, have, travel now. Yeah. Yeah. And they had nothing. They didn't want to buy boats. They just wanted liquid stuff that they could play with. And so they went and bought Rolex. <laughs> yeah. Uh, BT follows up here. He sold 17 watches this past year that he wasn't spending much time with and was able to try other watches. And, uh, I think that's awesome. I, <laughs> we're pretty similar. I think I sold about the same. I, I was about 18 watches this past year. Uh, and, and Insta Blaine is out there in California and we're both 49ers fans. So hopefully we do good tomorrow against the Texans. I need to learn that trick of selling. Cause I got about 18 that I really should, <laughs> that I really should sell. So the pigs and blanket said that we just described a bubble here. Are we in a bubble mark? Well, you know, th that's an interesting point the pigs in the blankets Be the problem is is that people have been calling the rolex market a bubble ever since i got into watches 10 years ago yeah um and, and look what i think the market is is a whole lot more like the stock market than it is like the um the rolex or than it is like the tulip black tulips phenomenon so we'll come back to that in a second but you have a super chat Hey, Sam Ray out there in Texas. Bruce, thoughts on collectors turning more to micro brands such as Monta, Traska, Aster, and Banks. And yeah, let me pull up my desk view real quick here. Let's add this back to the stream. Um, and I got a really good oh, one here. Now you've got a giant super chat that you'll have to have a look oh, at. Oh my goodness. Yeah. We'll get to you in just a minute there. Um, so this is a Brelm. This is I would say a micro brand, they make less than 300 per year. They're Swiss made, the row is a chronometer. I would say they're comparable in quality to Monta, maybe a little bit above Monta. And I think there is something alluring and appealing about going into a brand that is not necessarily well-known. Maybe it's well-known within watch enthusiast circles, but uh, the main watch public, it's kind of a hidden secret. I find that enjoyable. So, um, yeah, I, I think I'm all for it. I'd like to see more brands become successful, more upstart brands. You know, other than value retention, all the, all the horological values in micro brands, what you can get for $500 is staggering. Look at that super chat. Yeah. I can't believe that LPG 12338. That is so generous. I saw <laughs> away. Yeah, thank you very much. That is so kind. Uh, please, if you have a question, put it in the chat here and me and Mark will spend some time and, and go over that. That is really kind of you. So, Bruce, you know, I want to show you another watch and it's really on point with exactly where we are right now. Um, and so let me just show you a watch and then we can talk about it if you want. Yes. Oh, yeah. There we go. Hey, I've got kind of a regret. I can talk about that right there. Oh. Let's hear it. So when that first came out, I thought it would, I mean, I went to my authorized dealer and I saw all the colors and I like what Rolex and Tudor are doing when they announce a watch, they send it to their authorized dealer. So the next day you can go down 
and check it out. Uh, so I saw all the colors and I was really drawn to that turquoise. And I said, you know, when you guys, you know, uh, can sell one, I, I'd love to buy one. And it was a few months later, but I, I got a call from my, my authorized dealer and they said, hey, do you want this turquoise? <laughs> I said, no. I said, no, because I had just bought that overseas. And uh, I'm like, oh, I've got time. Yeah. It just came out. Get me next time, you know, is what I said. And now you can't get them. There was, uh, there was, there was not to be a next time. Yeah. So I think I, I, uh, I, I missed my chance on that one at retail, but man, that's a stunner, Mark. Well, I had the same experience as you. Okay. Except for, I don't think I was, I don't, I didn't have your foresight because when, when this thing came out, um, I, and, and, and all the various colors, I looked at them and I thought, yeah, that is not Rolex like it's not serious. It's not steady. It's not collectible. It's not safe. And this was the, this was really where, my own personal failing was, was um, requiring like the sure thing, the absolute sure bet that I could get my money out if I needed to. And so I just delayed. And what happened was um, over the ensuing months, the more I looked at it, the more I softened up to it, the more I liked it, the more I started to get interested in it. The sad reality is that anybody who told their AD within the first 60 days of this thing, uh, you know, being inaugurated, they got one at sure. $5,900. Oh, like all of them got that. Um, but then, because most people didn't like it and slowly it grew on me. And then by the time I was like ready to make a move, it had gone double retail and it was unavailable at the AD. And I looked at it at double retail and I thought, this is baloney. <laughs> like this is offensive. It's an eight, it's a, it's an OP 41. How dare that? Yeah. The entry level Rolex, right? Yeah. So I had this reaction where like I was just, you know, too smart to pay, you know, $12,000 for one of these. And I was going to wait till it dipped back down to eight because I was pretty sure it was going to. And then it went to 14 and then it went to 16 and then it went to 18. And at 18, I thought, OK, I'm, I got to like stop thinking about this because there's no there will be no I, I don't I don't need to make money on a watch, Bruce. I just need to not lose my shorts if one day I wake up and I don't like watches anymore. You know, because like I have more in watches than than what I spent on my first two houses back when I was a younger man. Like, sure. Right. Sure. So I just need to know I can get out without being hurt. That's all. Um, but then um, something happened and the, it was not the Patek Philippe Nautilus and Tiffany Blue that came out. That wasn't what happened. What happened was I started talking to ADs in a few locations who let it slip that their reps had told them to not take orders for this watch because it was going to be discontinued. And I, I didn't believe it when I heard it from the first AD, but then I got multiple confirmations of the same information from different parts of the country. And then I realized, oh, yeah. okay, it's, this is going. And nobody has told the ADs when my best guess is first quarter or first half of next year, even though, oh, and I sure didn't believe it because it's still in the catalog. If yeah. you, it's in the catalog and yeah, on the well, website. That, right. And normally they just take something out and that's, then they inform the AD like at the same time, but they've done something different here, I believe, or I'm just wrong. So I thought, okay, I want to get one of these because it's, it, it'll hold value when they discontinue it. At least I'd be able to get out without getting killed. So I bought one. I made a video about it. I told everybody I know if you want one, get it now because it's that 18,000 is just going to go nowhere but up. We've got a window of opportunity if you want one. Crazy money. But then two, three weeks later, Patek Philippe comes out with that $5 million Nautilus. And this thing is now uh, approximately... I mean, I can't tell you if they're really selling, but $40,000 yeah. and every Rolex collector is angry and yeah. hateful and, and, and scornful, but they're all listed in the 40s now. So. Yeah, I, I well, it kind of goes back to that bubble comment. I remember, you know, when the panda came out and everyone was freaking out and saying, well, it'll never cross 20. It, I mean, that's just stupid. And then, you know, blew past 20, 25, 30. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised to see 50 at some point. Oh, well, that is my prediction. It's going to hit 55 by the end of the year. That is it. You heard it here first. This is my 2022 Daytona prediction 
It's going to hit, it's going to hit 55. That's what I think. Do I want it to hit 55? No. Do I think it's worth 55? No, I, I, I do not. So don't, don't think that I'm out here like trying to screw the little guy who would love to get one. No, I think it's worth its MSRP. In fact, honestly, I think it's worth like maybe $20,000. That's, but above that, there's too much else that you can, that you can buy. But Rolex is the safe bet. It's the desirable bet. Um, and yeah. And, and I wonder how much of this is just, you know, silly, like, like, um, we can set the price as a market, whatever we want, but how many are, are changing hands? I know that it does happen, but how frequently, you know, if the, if that OP is being listed at 45, does that mean a dealer's paying 38, 35? Like what was the last one sold? I would be curious to know those, those types well, of information. You no, know, eBay right now is showing the last one that I can find sold on eBay sold December 16 for I think $28,000. So that's not too bad. I mean, it's crazy, but it's not too bad. Yeah. Um, but I can tell you this, I, I turned down a hard offer of $30,000 from a reseller uh, about a week or 10 days ago. So if they were offering me 30, I'm sure they would have been selling for like 38. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you'd want to do what? 20% probably. I think 20, 25%. I mean, look, it's crazy. Is It's not worth it. <laughs> okay. However, um, I didn't buy it to sell it. All I wanted to know was if I spend the insane and offensive, then offensive, sum of $17,900 on this watch. All I wanted to know was, could I get $17,900 for it? Could I get at least $17,000 for it if I had to dump out of it? I really didn't care if I got 20, 30. Uh, all I wanted to know was, could I get 16, nine? Could I experience this watch for a couple of years and not completely lose my shorts? Um, I, I think it will have turned out better for me than that. Um, it is upsetting a lot of people. <laughs> but uh, I'm kind of enjoying the, the I'm, I'm enjoying the, the, the buzz and the fuss a little bit. Sure. So uh, here's the question. I meant to get to it earlier. How, or have you heard anything about the other OP colors being discontinued? So what do you say, Mark? Well, I was talking to my friend Mackenzie. I, I like to call him the rain man of Rolex because he's got this like freakish, you know, um, knowledge of the small details. And so he was the person that I called when um, I first heard that this was going to be discontinued because I was trying to wrap my head around how are they going to discontinue something that's still on the website and that has been around for such a brief period of time. And instantly, just like Rain Man, Qantas, Qantas never crashed. You know, Mackenzie says, Stella Dials, Stella Dials, 1970s, Stella Dials, Turquoise, first one canceled. And, and what he told me, and he just like knew it off the top of his head that in, in the 70s when they came out with those Stella Dials, those dials were only out for two to three, four years each. They were a fairly short period of time that yeah. Rolex had them out. And, um, and, and the turquoise was the first one canceled. And it was out for a year and a half or so when they did it. And he said, oh, my God, they're going to do the same thing all over again. So we tend to think of Rolex as very stodgy and very incremental and very slow to change. And most of the time they are. But there is historical precedent for a wild fun color to come out boop, for like 10 minutes and then to be yanked away yeah. and the price to be nuts because all those Stella dials are, are six figures now. So it it's reasonable to assume that uh, the current Stella dials will be discontinued in the same order that they were 50 years ago. You know, I don't know what that order is other than turquoise being first, but if you have the opportunity to get one, get one. Yeah. I mean, Somebody on my channel just contacted me and was able to acquire a green one not all that long ago. Mm -hmm. um, you know, good on him because th those are cool too. I love the coral one as well. Oh, the coral is gorgeous. So good. And that yeah. coral one is 15000 I think, on the secondary market, which again is insane. I grant you it's a $6,000 watch, not a $15,000 watch. Uh -huh. But... Um, I'm, I have to take it easy now. Like I've just done too much lately, but I'm, I'm pretty sure there's going to come a point where I'm going to kick myself for not having, you know, rolled the dice on 15,000 for that coral because I, I think it's going to double. Yeah. So, hey, let me show you a watch that I got recently. Um, we talked about it. We've, 
kind of mentioned it here. But this is the 326934 reference. This is called the bright black, which in certain lights, it kind of looks like a standard black Rolex lacquer dial. And then in other lights, you really see that sun ray. I don't know if you can really tell here in this stream, but it's so pretty. And then you got the fluted yeah. bezel, the white gold ring command bezel, and the Jubilee bracelet, annual calendar, a GMT. <laughs> and uh, oh my goodness, I've been head over heels with this. I, I just got this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, just before that $400 price increase here on this specific model. And uh, this is probably my most exciting addition over the past year. So, uh, can you make it yeah. full screen, Bruce? Yeah, I can. Here, let me do that real quick. Let's let's jump in. Let's jump in deep, guys. This, this watch is worth looking at real close. Oops, I am having trouble with the stream. <laughs> there, we go. there we go. There we go. Look at that. Can you tilt it a little bit so we can see the, the depth on the, uh, if you, when, when that watch is tilted, what you start to notice is how tall those stick markers are. There's real architecture inside that dial. Yeah. It's just beautiful. Yeah. So, um, I great. mean, I, head over heels. I tried to stay up last night to watch the, <laughs> the month change from the 12 o'clock to the one o'clock, but I couldn't make it. I got to about 1130 and then, <laughs> You know, I just, uh, I couldn't, I've got a six month old baby. So to be fair, I've been, I've had interrupted sleep for a while. You know what? I wasn't sure how I felt about that Jubilee bracelet until today when I saw somebody on Instagram posted the blue one on the Jubilee and then on the oyster bracelet. Cause he has both. Yeah. And then, um, you know what? For the first pickup, you, you made the right choice. It is so much more intriguing, I think, on that Jubilee because it gives it a little bit of flash all the way around. Yeah, I um, I mean, there's something with the pairing of fluted and Jubilee. I think it's just fitting. I, I like this watch on Oyster with the polished center links, but I think my favorite is, is with the Jubilee. And the nice thing is I can order the Oyster and I plan on doing that at some future point. So, so cool that you can do that. Yeah. All right, let me uh, remove this and we'll get back to, there we go. We're we'll back to our stream here. Yeah. Uh, Mark, what, what's been another addition that you can show over the past year we can talk about? Oh gosh, let me think. What else did I buy? Um, oh, early this year. Okay, so from the sublime to the ridiculous. Um, I am, I am usually about a year behind Random Rob, like a whole year. Super chat. Hey, Cowboy Swami, I appreciate that. Thank you. My favorite watch is the Deep Sea. How is it, Mark? What's your thoughts on it? Bruce, love your Sky Dweller. That's killer. Thanks, guys. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Cowboy Swami. That is so great. Thank you very much. Mark, take it away. I got to say, your Sky Dweller does give me like little pangs because I, I, had, a, I, had, a, I had a mad passionate affair with a two-tone white dial Sky Dweller for about eight months, and then I, and then I sold it off. Um, but it, it is quite something that watch you know um cowboy put us in put in the comments how big is your wrist um and i think it's just so i can kind of see how big your wrist is in, in in dimensions here's the thing about that wrist um i've only got a seven and a quarter inch wrist but what you're going to notice here gentlemen please try and control yourselves would you look at the beauty of this flat wrist bone that i have here i mean this is now Bruce, hold up your chubby round wrist because here's the funny thing. We have the same exact, so Cowboy 725 like me. Now, we have the same size wrist, but yours is a bit rounder and mine is a bit flatter. And sure. what, that, what that means is, here's your advantage, Bruce, on that round wrist. You can wear a rubber strap because it'll curve around the curvature of your wrist and it fits well. On a flat wrist like mine, a rubber strap just like sticks out and it's uncomfortable and it doesn't lay right. Okay. As far as the, um, as far as the <laughs> calico is laughing at my description of your wrist as chubby. You know what? I am a little bit chubby. I got some weight to lose. Oh, That's no, no. It has absolutely got to do with the, <laughs> that wasn't a BMI. That wasn't a weight joke. No, um, I'm not offended at all it has completely to do with one's wrist configuration because you got your round and your flat. And um, so here's the thing. I can just barely, Cowboy Swami, I can just barely pull it off, okay? It is a 44 millimeter, super tall, like 18 millimeters thick. 44 millimeters isn't so bad. It's probably 
55 maybe in, in, in wingspan. So it's a massive, massive watch. If you have round wrists, it's going to rock around and won't sit right. If you have a 7.25 inch wrist and your wrist bone is sexy and flat like that one, then you can probably pair it off. You can probably work it out because you've got the distance from bone to bone to, to you know, to, to deal with that watch head. If you, if you have a round wrist, man, pass it up and instead get yourself a 50th anniversary sea dweller, which you would enjoy a whole lot more. <laughs> <laughs> this comment's awesome. I, you guys crack me up sometimes and I, I love it. I love being a part of this community. Yeah. Uh, awesome comment, Stephen. Here's another watch that I, I bought earlier this year. Uh, this is the Zenith Defy Classic. This oh, yeah. is a 41 millimeter size with the grade five titanium bracelet, the open work dial. This has, um, it's called the Elite 670 SK Movement. It's got a silicon escapement. It's anti-magnetic. It has good loom. And it's just a visual stunner from a brand that produces about twenty to 25,000 watches every year. And so this has been one that I've been particularly excited about uh, <laughs> for myself. And I wanted to show that off there. Have you ever tried one of those on, Mark? No, no, I have not, but that is your second vessel and constant thing, is, is it? No, not? this one's a Zenith. I used the Zenith. Um, I had a Zenith El Primero, but I have not tried that one on. Um, I was not a big fan of the El Primero. Of the, yeah, not a, not a big fan. I enjoyed it for the six months that I kept it. Um, but um, I, I must say when I go to the boutique, they catch my eye. Um, I love the logo. I love the second hands with the star counterbalance on them. Yeah, I do, I do like the brand, and someday or another, I want to try another one. Amazing. Well, l let me ask you a question. I think we're we're coming up on an hour. Um, I want to be respectful of your time and and everyone watching. Uh, but what are you looking forward to in twenty twenty two, Mark? Do you have your eye on any particular piece? You know, be it affordable, yeah. mid level, luxury, high horology. Where do you plan on going this year? Well, in Rolex, there's nothing affordable. <laughs> you know, so like <clears throat> that's out. I would say, at least in terms of Rolex right now, <clears throat> excuse me. What I'm looking for is um, I have this is what I'm going to ask my AD for. I have a watch that I like, I think theoretically they could get for me. And then I want my Hail Mary pass, right? So I'll start with the Hail Mary pass. I would love any gold Daytona on Oyster Flex. Yes. But yes. if it could have a meteorite dial. <laughs> you said could or couldn't. If it, if it could, please, please, dear God, if it could possibly have a meteorite dial, you know, I'll be your best friend. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I tried that exact watch on like two months ago at my oh, authorized yeah. dealer. And uh, I don't know if I've sent you pictures or not. If I haven't, I need to. Yeah. But that thing is otherworldly stunning. Oh, my goodness. But it's a miracle that your AD got one because I think a lot of ADs have never even seen one. Yeah. So, like, that's really cool that that you were able to, like, photograph that watch. So that's my Hail Mary pass. I, I, I think it's highly unlikely just because I don't think they get those uh, very often. But um, otherwise, I think um, I might like to flesh out my Submariner collection with a sermon. So DA machine got a, uh, you got a Platona. That is really he has, beautiful. He has everything and he has I, three of everything. I, I do know that he has a pretty extensive collection. Yeah, I want to be the machine when I grow up. Yeah. I I've seen the platinum Daytona, but it was like four years ago. Um, I've got uh, some footage of me doing a little wrist roll with it. And I just was amazed at the weight and that shade of blue. It really is a lovely watch. So congrats on that. That is really cool. It is beautiful. I never, tried that one on but i did try on the arctic blue dial platinum day date at my ad which i i assume is probably similar in weight to uh the machine's platona and it's a formidable watch uh hisham hisham habib uh, has one one of the original cardinals he's got one also and um you're you, you, you you're gonna develop like biceps it would sure. be like on ankle weights <laughs> you know that's quite a prodigious watch so you say you love a D the Daytona on Oyster Flex, hopefully meteorite. Is there anything else that you're excited about? I would love to get a Sermit. Um, I have a gold Rolex with the blue, blue, and it's beautiful. But I wonder if uh, if I shouldn't have had a white gold one instead, because I think it might have been more wearable. So I toy with the idea of eventually trading it in on a white gold one. And then I want to briefly fill you in on what I hear 
rumors about Rolex supply. But first, we have a super chat. Yes. Timeless sneakers and watches. Thank you. With Rolex skyrocketing, do you guys think Tudor will ever discontinue the Black Bay 58 blue, silver, and gold, subsequently creating more hype for Tudor and the 58? Do you, you have think? any initial thoughts on that, Mark? Well, I don't think I, I think Tudor is going to crank them out robotically. Dum, 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 dum. You, what Tudor typically does is they make you think that a watch is going to be exclusive by promoting the living heck out of it and then putting like three into the authorized dealer. And then they create the hype. Nobody can get one for six months. And then just when everybody is like going crazy for that watch, they flood the market. Now, that hasn't happened this year with your Panda, but it has yeah. been. Most of those Black Bay 50. Remember when you couldn't even get a blue one? When you couldn't get a GMT, you know, the Diet the diet Coke or the Diet Pepsi? Um, and now they're pretty much in all the, uh, the cases. So, no, uh, I think that is a huge moneymaker for Tudor. And I don't think they're going to – I think they're going to keep knocking them out. I could see them discontinuing, say, the silver or the gold. I don't know. You know, I know the silver is fairly popular. I – can't say that I've ever seen the gold. I don't know how many that they make or how many that are sold, but I could see them discontinuing maybe some of the more exotic metals. But as far as the steel, I, I really don't foresee them doing that. I don't think it would be wise for them to do that. The bronze one was boutique only. And, yeah. uh, and there's not even a boutique in the United States. So, and weirdly, that's the one I think that everybody would really love to have would be that bronze one. But very, very smart of Tudor to come out with that. And I bet you within a couple of years, we'll see a, a slightly different variation of that, different dial. Maybe they're going to do a bronze. Uh, DM Machine says it was 12400 when he bought his before the, the increase. Which watch are you talking about? Yeah, let us know in the comments. While we're waiting for that, um, yeah, that is, um, he's talking about the, um, the Steel Daytona there. Okay. So I have, uh, I've gotten word that Rolex supply is um, increasing right now, which is a good thing. Uh -huh. um, I, got, I have multiple ADs telling me that they were getting only one shipment per month and that also Rolex typically doesn't ship after Christmas. Like yes, they're, they're, they, like, they shut down for a while. Yeah, so they're not going to do that this year. They're going to keep shipping. And not only are they going to keep shipping, which takes – eight weeks where they don't normally ship and puts them back into the shipping cycle. But instead of shipping once a month, they're going to ship twice a month. So I think the ADs are hoping to get a bit more inventory than normal at the beginning of the year. So guys, if there's something that you've been craving that isn't impossible. Um, Say like an Air King or, you know, something like that. Or HS41. Yeah, it's a, it might be a good time to go talk to your AD because their supplies may be rising. The other problem is the ADs have been basically told by Rolex to sell to people that they know. They've been told to be careful about who they sell to, um, which makes it very hard for a guy who has never bought a Rolex before from the AD to buy another one. Yeah. You know, and that's really unfortunate. So you you are in the unfortunate position of kind of having to romance your AD. If you, I'm sure you've had this happen to you, Bruce. You go into an AD wearing a Rolex that you didn't get from them. They notice that they're always going to ask you, "Where did you buy? Who sold you?" That? Oh, for sure, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I've had that happen. Yeah, and that's because they want they just want to know, are you in the club or not? That, that's I think what they want to know. <laughs> Hey, let's, let's do, oh, we've got a couple super chats. And then I've got a comment that I want to go back to here. The first one is from Jason. How's it going, man? Any feelings on Grand Seiko? Uh, yes, I have several feelings on Grand Seiko and, and we'll, we'll have Mark uh, share his as well. But I think they've really been stepping up their game. They have beautiful watches. They're produced in fairly limited quantities. They're hand assembled, hand finished in Japan and every time I film one, like it's so apparent that the craftsmanship is, is very high. It's very impressive. And I think they have some weak spots, um, mainly the bracelets. Uh, and they've been stepping up recently. The one that came on the white birch that my father purchased, that one felt very solid, much nicer than previous bracelets. So I think they're on an upward trajectory and for myself, it's a matter of time before I end up buying one because I think they're works of art 
and I do love Seiko. I do have a soft spot for Seiko. And so the ultimate Seiko, you know, yeah, I'm drawn to the idea. Those are some of my thoughts. Mark, do you have any thoughts on Grand Seiko? Well, I'm going to have to dump out of this in a moment. I'm so sorry. But oh, you're fine. I didn't realize. But however, I, I want to say the only area on your comments that you just made that I could disagree with you on at all, because I think that was a very good summation, is the finishing. On most good luxury brands of watches, the finishing is excellent. And I know that that the the Zeratsu polishing is hand polishing on a on a wheel, a mm -hmm. wheel. So a, a craftsman has physically done this. It's not being done robotically. And that does take a really good eye, a very highly trained craftsman to do that. And I admire that. However, when I look at my Zeratsu polished Grand Seiko dive watch and I compare it, for example, to the curvature and the polish on the Daytona. I can't see the difference, um, to be honest with you. So I wonder if that Zeratsu polishing is a little overblown. And also too, you know, you get out there in the real world, you get little nicks and scratches on things. And uh, you know, your Zeratsu just, you know, just, just Zeratsu its way. So um, what, what I think is Grand Seiko uh, is, is a brand, I really think, this is what I think, everybody ought to have one, but just one. <laughs> hey if you need to run i want to be uh, respectful of your time i really appreciate you coming in Monica. i really do so thank you so much for having me yeah let's do this again for sure for sure let's do it again thank you guys you carry on gentlemen bruce williams i salute you sir all right we'll see you mark um I, one more thing i wanted to add about that i know mark has just left but um when i mentioned the finishing you look at the little details, say the finishing on the applied markers on a Grand Seiko, and they're so small, they're so minute, but <laughs> they look perfect, right? And I, I find that impressive. Like, let me let me do this uh, desk view real quick. Uh, on my Sky Dweller, if you go in on a macro level, it's very sharp, and I don't think there's anything glaringly bad, but if you zero in... Uh, you can find just the hint of some blemish marks on the white gold markers, particularly the one at the uh, 11 o'clock position. And, you know, I mean, there's a difference. This is a roughly $15,000 watch. And when you're buying a $7,000, $8,000 Grand Seiko, a lot of times you're not going to get that type of blemish, although it, it certainly can happen. Um, but yeah, those are some of the feelings on Grand Seiko there. And then I wanted to shout out Mr. GMT. Happy New Year. Thanks for the awesome content. I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Uh, let me get to one question here. Uh, let me go back up. This one is from David. So Omega in 2022, will they benefit from no watches in the Rolex authorized dealer? And I think they really benefited from that in 2020, 2021 to a degree but there was a time when Omega, they changed the margins that they sell uh, the watches to their authorized dealers. They uh, raised it. So authorized dealers are paying more for the same watches and they're not going to take that away from their profit margin. They're going to pass that added cost onto the consumer. And so we've seen greatly reduced discounts and in some, you know, some instances, no discounts. <laughs> so, you know, as a watch enthusiast, I think that definitely has an effect, especially for like a first time luxury buyer who, you know, is expecting at least 15% off. And when he's told, yeah, maybe 10, we might do tax if, you know, if we're feeling generous, I think that individual could be turned away and they could go to a different brand that maybe they could get more of a discount on. And so I do think on the whole, Omega will definitely benefit in the coming year, but um, <laughs> it might start slowing down a little bit as discounts dry up. And uh, I don't know if, I don't know if watch enthusiasts are prepared to pay full retail for a lot of Omegas yet. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that changes. So let's see. Do you guys have any other comments here? I know we've gone a little over an hour here. Calico Basin asks any rumor of a Coke bezel. Uh, I hope so. I would love that. I love the GMT Master 2. And I like the Pepsi, but the Coke would be, oh, that'd be awesome. I mean, I could wear it with my, my Utes jersey, right? <laughs> and Tim says Omega's price has already increased. Yeah, they, they did. Uh, retail prices. I mean, that's the one thing that you can always be sure of is death and taxes and uh, retail price increases on the brands that we love. So yeah, awesome chat. 
Hey, thank you. Lifestyles of the ambitious. I appreciate that. I, I, I really do. Uh, and Z pigs and blankets says that the, this was fun today. So awesome. Uh, I'm glad you guys liked it. I think we'll leave it here tonight. I really appreciate you guys. And again, um, uh, we'll, we'll do this. We'll do a live stream. I'd like to do this regularly. I like to have guests again, uh, like Mark. And if there's someone you would like me to uh, converse with here on the channel in a live stream, you're welcome to put that in the comments or send me an email and I'll see if I can make that happen. I'd, I'd love to do that. So uh, thank you for watching. Have a great rest of your Saturday and happy new year.